to just say a few words. Um, uh, so yesterday, um, we spent uh, most of the time uh, getting going on uh, projects, and I want to make sure that all the teams are empowered to do that uh, uh, as much of today uh, and tomorrow, and uh, if you're able to stay for Saturday as, as possible. And as I've encouraged, that means um, uh, if you'd like to, um, to to work with your TA uh, at any point, um, regardless of whether or not I happen to be giving a lecture, you're welcome to do so. Okay, so so please uh, um, pair up with your TA. Now it, it's come to my uh, attention uh, visually that not all the TAs are here at all times, um, and um, and I don't want that to pose a barrier. Uh, so if you don't see you're particularly a TA here and you'd like to work on your project, just uh, easiest thing to do is uh, probably to ask another TA to reach out and contact them um, and, and they should be able to get them here pronto. Um, or ask me <clears throat> if I'm in a position to be responsive. Um, uh, the other thing I'm going to do, which I haven't, um, but it's my, uh, it's been my plan all along to, to see if I can do it, is to provide a con set of contact information for the TAs so you can reach out to them easily via ma mail, okay? And um, maybe I can ask one of uh, the, the TAs to start building up a list like that where you put uh, TA names and, uh, and emails just so I don't have to go populate it all during the break here, okay? Um, if someone could start a list and put it in the in the bootcamp folder um, that would let other participants uh, access it. Um, for lack of an obviously better option, I'd suggest Google Sheets uh, just being used to, to create that list. Uh, but um, you could also save it in PDF form. Um, so that's one point. I, I, I want to make sure the projects are empowered today. I would like to spend, I, yesterday I was circulating among some of the projects um, it's my intention to get around to all the projects today, um, or to finish getting around and, and ideally uh, reach all, in fact, today, um, to, to help those along, okay? And um, uh, I'm, I'm keen to see those advance. We will be spending most of the afternoon on project work. Um, uh, this morning, um, we'll go through a set of material that uh, is more conceptual but has a lot of practical implications um, and it will be pretty dense because we'll be covering a set of uh, a set of different topics um, from yesterday um, uh, I was very pleased to see uh, some progress and I know not everyone made the lecture in the afternoon about uh, networks um, but I systematically um, went through a couple different network types um, that offer that are offered built-in support in any logic. I noted that um, these network types, uh, uh, each of them is associated with a specific set of parameters that you specify, and the parameters vary from network type to network type. So, for example, for a Poisson random network, you just specify a, a mean number of connections per person. By contrast, for a small world network, you specify that and a fraction of contacts which are with local people. Um, uh, for a distance-based network, you specify a distance threshold, shown on the board here. Um, uh, so uh, we, we will often make use of different network types on an exploratory basis. Um, to understand how does network structure impact the dynamics of the model. Um, when we're dealing with empirical data, as, as uh, discussed some yesterday, it's, um, uh, there's, there's a choice uh, more. If you have network data from the world, there's a choice whether you want to import it. And uh, this choice, to a degree, it's, it mirrors a choice on uh, with respect to characteristics of agents. Um, to what degree are the agents in the model generated synthetically 
based on, say, some distributions or, or some, uh, um, uh, some representative values uh, that you believe uh, obtained from the world, uh, describing that population? And to what degree do you actually seek to instantiate them with very particular properties reflecting a specific population or cohort of interest? This, this is an issue that comes up a fair bit in modeling, and you will find models that do both. Um, uh, you will find models that focus on one cohort and simulating over time the individuals in that cohort or study as they progress through health states or, or um, uh, are exposed to environments. And there's reasons for doing that. Um, it turns out that you'll also find, and I would say the majority of models tend to synthetically produce a population within the model. And then there's kind of an intermediate um, type of modeling where you use what are called synthetic po uh, population databases, where people have pre-generated uh, populations that are representative for a given area of the world, and you load those into your model. So you can kind of create the agent synthetically entirely in the model uh, on the far extreme, you can, on the other extreme, load in an exact representation one by one, a representation of people in the world that were actually in your study or in your cohort. <coughs> and the midpoint is you load in previously generated synthetic populations that were, were precisely generated at some point um, to have characteristics mirroring those in the world, um, even though they're not generated within the model itself. Um, these are are three um, notable paradigms within modeling. Um, uh, the, of them, the less common one is, the, the one that's not uncommon, but it's less frequent, is to load in specific individuals. We've done quite a few studies like that, but most of our studies do not use that um, mode. Why would you do that? Why would you, you know, uh, put in representations of actual people. And what are some considerations when you do that? Well, if you, if you believe the results um, uh, from the model will be very person specific, um, maybe you're seeking your model with the particular, the peculiarities of your particular population. You wanna see if it reproduces patterns that you see over time from an actual cohort study or actual, you know, uh, actual following of these individuals. That's one reason. Um, uh, another reason is uh, you you actually have data in a very intensive way about these individuals, and uh, you want to uh, use that information to drive model representation of latent factors that were not recorded for those people. Um, uh, in the model um, and, and, uh, and understand the implication, maybe distally, like after the cohorts, long after the cohort study finished, what, what might be the implications after it, or, or for the first one to compare. Um, an example of this is uh, Winchell, who was here yesterday, the king. He, um, he has created a number of uh, models where the model is actually driven by empirical network data collected every five minutes from smartphones. Uh, <coughs> we first started doing work on this in the 2009-2010 flu pandemic with these small sensors, and we have, you know, with the system that came out of that, somewhere between 100 and 150 studies have been conducted by people worldwide, uh, some of them not involving uh, me or, or the other uh, co-creator of the system. Um, but using this sort of very detailed data. And we can drive a model with, say, contact network data and use that to understand patterns of infection spread in that particular population that might not have all been observed. We might have had some people present for care, but others uh, not, and we might infer something about uh, who, was, uh, who was at risk, who spread to whom, et cetera. Um, 
Another thing is we might have data on people's movement patterns in a geographic area, and we want to know to what degree were they exposed to adverse air quality. And maybe that wasn't collected in the study itself, but, um, but by linking that data to, to air quality databases from municipalities, you might be able to know these individuals were exposed to this adverse, um, adverse air quality at different times, and you might then um, use that to, uh, to simulate um, what some hidden health outcomes might have been, um, or, or project it forward after the time of the study itself, the, the longer term consequences. Um, another, uh, another thing you might do, um, which is something we've done, is take some of that data, drive the model with it, and then ask a counterfactual question. Suppose with this cohort, we um, had put into place a vaccination intervention, for example. How would the infection have spread differently, plausibly, in this cohort, given the same contact patterns, the same basic patterns associated with risk behavior? How might have things played out if certain people had been vaccinated or, or uh, a certain vaccination target level had been achieved? Um, how could it have been different in that case? We actually have observations about how it did turn out in the factual case that uh, people had the, the, the actual number of vaccinations they did, but we can ask counterfactual questions by linking it to a model. And um, that's a, a different type of study you run with a, a particular population. It is not unusual at all in the micro simulation community to drive a micro simulation model with an extremely detailed representation of actual individuals in the population to understand for all the vagaries of that population how might um, different pension strategies play out in terms of fiscal implications and in terms of, uh, of support for individuals um, or how might health insurance schemes um, have an impact or what have you. So, so while not the most common strategy, putting individuals into your model is not unusual, and I've mentioned just a few of the uh, many motivations uh, or the benefits people secure from that. Um, for most of our studies, we will have a population which has some characteristics, and we will end up imposing in any logic a population that looks like that in some characteristics, even though the, the details of it uh, differ in its particular So uh, We don't have one person represented on a one-to-one -one basis with one in the, in, the, in the simulation. But there's good reasons for doing that. And since my earliest times focused on applying these techniques to health, there have been a persistent set of inquiries for uh, our work from clinicians seeking to communicate to particular patients um, using models. And the idea here is you take a model and you have kind of a virtual twin in the model. And you can ask questions very specific to your situation and lifestyle in the model and ask what if questions. You know, what if I could quit smoking? How might things play out for me? And the model is used there as a storytelling vehicle. Um, uh, I remember being a, approached by this back in 1999 about some of our smoking models. But uh, Jan's model um, on DIP, on diabetes and pregnancy, tells quite compelling stories about uh, women's experience of diabetes and pregnancy, its linkages to lifestyle modification and persistence uh, to, to adherence levels with um, insulin use during pregnancy for women with with um, more severe dysglycemia, um, and, and how that ends up affecting their children and, and their experience of future pregnancies and the risk of type 2 diabetes. So models can be compelling clinical discussion tools as well at an individual level. And that's kind of an extreme example of this idea of instantiating a particular subpopulation in the model in all its, in its particulars. Um, uh, so, 
you know, one, one use of, of models that I suspect will be seeing more, um, uh, more use in coming years. Um, okay, so um, networks. I had also noted that AnyLogic does supply, uh, provide good support for um, these built-in networks, but you can also very readily add support for uh, custom networks. Um, adding connections between agents, eliminating connections between agents. And in, an, uh, in a model with an open population, people saying being born, people immigrating, people leaving, you're, the issue of network dynamics is almost thrust upon you. Um, if a baby's born, the question then comes, okay, what are we going to assume about the baby's connections? Um, and needing to lend them some connections in the model will be something that would be on your mind. So for many models, um, it's not so much a matter that you want to make networks um, you know, changing every five minutes. It may be a matter, however, that as the population membership changes, the model's uh, representation of the networks has to adapt with that. Um, so just uh, bear that in mind. I also talked about any logic support for multiple types of networks. Um, at the same time, so a given individual within, um, within an agent-based model is often fruitfully associated with more than one sort of network. And it bears noting, um, it took me a couple of years for this to really sink in in its deepest way, as is typical. It takes a while for things to get through my head. And um, I... You know, I, I, I had long conceptualized networks as a useful way to think about people and their connections, et cetera. But um, just how different different types of uh, networks are hadn't really been driven home to me in, in health. But of course, when we're dealing with a, um, uh, a contact network associated with needle sharing for uh, intravenous drug use, it's very different from a contact network associated with sexual transmission or associated with spread of uh, uh, norms and attitudes online. Um, it's not to say there's no common features. There's a huge number of common features, but when I say it's very different, the notion of what it means for A to contact B is quite different. The, 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 the notion of A contact and the contact rate um, uh, from one could be very different from the other. So, you know, needle sharing has a very different uh, type of contact process associated with it and different patterns that give rise to it uh, than, um, uh, than sexual transmission or sexual contact or than um, contact for a, uh, uh, a respiratory infection. So just be aware that when you're dealing with contact network, or when you're dealing with networks, um, you can make use, rather than trying to shoehorn everything into one network, it's often useful to create multiple networks. And I provided you with a set of uh, models, as you know, and one of the models, which I will just go and, um, and see if I can pull out, actually has uh, multiple networks. For example, this two distinct networks per person use any logic seven or this the somewhat longer rendition of it these are models that make use of of multiple networks and um uh, they're teaching examples but they might be interesting to look at and it's not infrequent we'll have something like a family network on the one hand and a friends network on another chin young's model of of e-cigarette and cigarette use has a distance-based network that's more opportunistic for um, sort of peer pressure, seeing the effects of seeing someone else nearby smoke, how that makes me feel about smoking, uh, use in the moment, or, or likelihood of using. But she also um, has the capacity to represent family um, within that network, which makes sense, because spread of norms might be useful there. Yes, uh, sure, Young. Needle sharing, we have, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, certainly Narja's back there in the corner has an extensive model of needle sharing. I'm trying to think if I've share, shared with you 
a model of that. She could show you um, uh, the the model uh, built for Vietnam and needle sharing. Let me just see if I uh, have something here. Forgive my uh, the arcanity of what you will now see uh, uh, proceed. Okay, so um, this is. Uh, uh, no, that's not it. Um, okay, um, okay, right. Uh, example models. Um, um, uh, okay, and uh, I'll just I'll just go see if I have um, any HIV ones here. Um, it doesn't look like I've provided you with one with needle sharing, but we have two of those, um, actually, now that I think about it, that you could readily look at. Um, and I will, I will add it in, okay? Um, get, uh, I'll, just, I'll just go at it right now, one of them, uh, bearing in mind that this one was sort of incomplete. Um, but I will also um, refer you to Narges, who has a very nice one that she's built up uh, with uh, another student um, involving uh, Vietnam. And, uh, and, and that one's also uh, something which you might, you, you should really look at because it's uh, a, uh, a stronger, stronger example, I'd say. But I will go post right now something called uh, Saskatchewan HIV Final Project. This is this was a class project. Um, it's actually been advanced since then, but um, as they say, ye chang mun So I don't want to lose time here, and I'll forget otherwise. So let me just um, let me just put it put it down, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get something to you. Um, rather than having me forget. Um, okay, so it's called S SKHIV Final Project, and that includes representation of needle sharing, uh, uh, sexual transmission networks for HIV in the Midwestern Canadian province of Saskatchewan. Okay? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to discuss that. The student actually who created that is Tina Thomas because she's um, doing some work involving a study of, uh, of, of impact of uh, screen time on, on teenagers uh, with our uh, Ethica data system uh, conducted in Switzerland. She's doing the analysis right now in an intensive way. So she's not here for the boot camp, but if you'd like to speak with her, um, uh, we could ask her to come over and she could you know, talk for an hour or something like that. It's no problem. She's just not serving us a TA. Okay? Um, great question. Um, yeah, um, uh, so uh, other questions that um, I could help address right now. Anything else arising from yesterday that people would like to, uh, to talk about? Anything? Okay, I'm not, uh, not hearing any uh, any strong interest expressed, uh, and so uh, there'll be lots of chance for or for questions um, later in this morning. But um, it's about nine thirty now. Um, I'd like to continue um, uh, to continue on to uh, some a series of topics. I'm going to try to get through three or four of them this morning. Okay, um, and. Uh, People are um, welcome to uh, to take to step out for projects at any time, but we'll see if we can um, uh, we can go through these in quick order. Uh, would people like to take a break right now or following the first topic? The first topic will probably take me uh, somewhat close to an hour to get through. After okay. That's uh, that's great. Um, okay, we'll, uh, we'll we'll do that then. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, um, so thanks for that feedback, and we will.